Um, so, uh, yes, I am Ron Bartek. I'm uh, co-founder and president of the Friedrichs Taxi Research Alliance. I'd like to begin by um, thanking the NASA organizers for including me in this panel discussion. But for the fact that this is the second time in my 20 years as a patient advocate that I've been asked to follow Pat Furlong, my dear friend. And I'm, please help me remember never to do it again. <laughs> Uh, and to refuse to appear after Pat Furlong. Um, so in way of full disclosure, um, I, I'd like to say that I'm going to give you a patient and family perspective on gene therapy, uh, despite the fact that in our disease, we, we have no gene therapies uh, currently in clinical trial. Um, so, but I will say that we've got about a half dozen companies and three or four universities aggressively advancing gene therapy programs for our rare disease. And so we're already grappling uh, with many of the issues you've heard other people talk about today, especially in terms of innovative clinical trial design that can um, uh, work around uh, some of these issues. Um, and uh, I'm especially pleased to be here because this issue of clinical trial design in uh, gene therapy trials is one of the key issues in, that came up um, in August of last year in a two-day conference on gene therapy. Uh, Dr. High and a couple of others uh, in the room uh, pre you know, presented at that conference. It was co-hosted at the NIH by the NCATS director and the FDA CBER uh, Office of Tissues and Advanced Therapies uh, director. And for two days, we heard um, academic and industry investigators talk about the issues that were confounding their gene therapy trials that were active. Um, they gave, gave the, in the presentations talks about the, their successes and challenges. Uh, the successes were varied. The challenges were all identical. And we, uh, at the end of that uh, this, this two-day conference, I uh, got together and identified five or six issues that were confounding all of those uh, investigations and uh, went to Chris Austin, the director of NCATS, and what we've done is created a, uh, an endorsed program at, at NCATS and uh, under the auspices of the Cures Acceleration Network Review Board. I have the privilege of serving um, as co-chair of that review board and on the advisory council of NCATS. And we've gotten those two organizations to adopt a program in gene therapy designed to come up with advanced technology platform solutions um, in, um, to address these issues and then make them, because of NIH funding, widely available and universally available to all these programs. I will <laughs> now in about 30 seconds tell you about from the perspective of our families what the issues are that most concern them. Safety, of course, but you have to keep in mind we have no uh, approved treatments in our disease. And so like several of others, or many others, the biggest risk we face daily is the lack of a therapy. So we're willing to take substantial risk. Um, because the, these gene therapies, as you've heard today, are most likely to be one-shot therapies for now, um, how do we be sure that the first dose is therapeutic? I, I, I don't know of a, a concern that's graver in our population than try, trying to make sure if we're going to sign up for phase one uh, and get that first in human dose, uh, tell me that my kid is going to have a potential therapy uh, response. Um, and, and do we need to change the paradigm of always starting in, in, in adults to prove safety? Can't we, especially with gene therapy in one shot, dose and time is of the essence, these kids are dying, uh, can't we break that paradigm uh, and start including, as Kathy High indicated in her study, uh, including pediatrics and adults in your first phase trials? Um, and can we break this uh, uh, notion that uh, it is going to be one and done? Uh, can we either use different vectors, different routes of administration, uh, so that over time we can get a second dose? Um, and um, 
and inclusiveness from the very beginning. Again, uh, we, we want to get pediatrics and adults um, engaged in our early stage cl clinical trials. And as I think John said earlier, can we even get pre-symptomatic pediatrics involved in those, because the treatment window obviously is going to be broadest in that. Um, are there alternatives to the placebo? Uh, are there, um, can we work around exclusion based on a previous exposure um, to, uh, whoops, uh, to clinical, um, to these uh, viral vectors? Um, um, and uh, so, um, can we, um, um, Uh, answer questions like how therapeutic will, will gene therapy be? Can we educate the, the patient uh, and the family about uh, expectations? How long will it take us to get to these particular rare diseases? We, we're going one at a time right now. We've got 7,000 other rare diseases. What are the longest poles in the tent for getting that? Manufacturing, uh, uh, affording manufacturing sufficient to provide vector for those small phase one clinical trials by academic investigators, rather than leaving all these investigations to the big drug companies who are going to cure, you know, treat one disease at a time by investing a two hundred million dollars in a manufacturing facility. That's way too slow, way too expensive. We've got to do better than that. Could NCATS and the FDA collaborate to develop a, a standardized clinical trial design that will be apl widely applicable to all those rare diseases? Um, and finally, will gene therapy uh, be accessible? Uh, will the pricing permit us to um, uh, provide ex uh, sustainable access to our patients, sustainable innovation for our industry partners, sustainable reimbursement for the payers, and overall sustainable um, uh, treatment for our whole healthcare economy. And I'll, in the interest of time, stop there. So, thank you.